What happens when you offer money to a stranger, no strings attached? People are skeptical. They think there must be a catch. Uh, it's the only time I have been accused of being part of the Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> What the heck is Universal Basic Income, or UBI, or UBI as no one calls it, offering periodic payment with no strings attached to everyone? In other words, <laughs> predetermined amount of money periodically, <laughs> predetermined amount of money periodically, <laughs> predetermined amount of money periodically. Why are you even talking about UBI? Well, I wanna find out if it's a great idea or if it's too good to be true, which, spoiler, by the end of this video, I won't know for sure, because no one knows for sure. Another reason I want to talk about it is because even though it is not a new idea, it goes back centuries. Wikipedia cites Sir Thomas More's early 16th century book Utopia as the earliest example. I'm just wondering if those sleeves are attached to a whole shirt or is he just wearing floofy red things? The point is, universal basic income, it's real hot right now. You may have heard of Andrew Yang, presidential candidate. It was a signature part of his platform. Mr. Yang, your signature policy is to give $1,000 a month, no questions asked. That's right. But will he go all the way to the White House? Nope, he dropped out. So he's done. Nope. He hasn't ruled out a run for mayor of New York City, and he's advocating for UBI to be tried there. Could be a very big deal, because New York does influence a lot of things that we all do. My mom still loves Cosmos. And now he's become a CNN political commentator, which is kind of a big deal, depending on how you feel about commentators and CNN, and now. Point is, the idea is out there and being talked about, and it's probably not going away anytime soon. Now, as soon as I started talking about UBI, I'm sure there are several concerns running through your head, and some of you may have commented some of them already. Things like, they'll just use the money for drugs. Everyone will stop working. How would you pay for it. It'll destroy the economy. They'll use it to gut welfare programs and communism. I will attempt to address all of these concerns as we try to answer the question, why do people like universal basic income? But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Curiosity Stream, a streaming service of all things, aptly named Smart. Maybe they got smart by watching the thousands of documentaries and nonfiction series that they have. Now, I know all you like to lay around and stream your stuff and chill, but if you add up all those services, that's hundreds of dollars. This is only $20 a year or $3 a month if you're a monthly type person. And who isn't? Look at this, Deep Ocean narrated by David Attenborough. I love me some Attenborough. I'm thinking of only showing my daughter Attenborough stuff while she grows up so that she eventually talks like David Attenborough. And then I'll just have a little Attenborough running around narrating snack time. This pretzel is super yummy. I can't do Attenborough. Is that bad parenting? Maybe I should watch from baby to kiss to learn how babies grow up. Go to curiositystream.com slash wheezywaiter and use the code wheezywaiter during sign up to get the first 30 days for free. That's like free money, which is what this video is about. Hey, speaking of, why do people like universal basic income? One, it can ease a transition in a rapidly changing world, they say. Cut to someone who isn't me. So if I was a student or again making a transition in life, I think a universal basic income would be incredible. I've been broke and being broke is really scary, is really depressing. I think this goes a long way to stopping that kind of pain in society. That's James L. Toucher, author, blogger, podcaster, former hedge fund manager, and recurring guest on my YouTube channel these days, apparently. What do I mean by rapidly changing world? Enter economist. Well, I'm not an economist. <laughs> Sorry, Chelsea Fagan, founder, writer, and host of the blog and YouTube channel, The Financial Diet, and recurring guest on my YouTube channel these days, apparently. Anyway, she's very comfortable saying definitely that universal basic income. So I don't feel comfortable saying that it is, no pun intended, universally a good or a bad thing. It could be something that is, is necessary in the coming years. Aside from things like automation and decreased jobs, there's also an aging population, a population that may not be able to work. So I think there are compelling reasons to experiment with something like this. The idea of rising automation and AI taking our jobs is a common fear these days, and it's one of the main reasons Andrew Yang uses to justify UBI. Hey, that rhymes. Justify my UBI, automate my jobs, but don't make me cry. Should have been Andrew Yang's campaign song. I'm not saying that would have kept him in the race, but I'm not not saying. And since robots displacing all of our jobs is a, one of the main concerns, let's talk about that first. James has a lot to say about it. There has been improvements in technology almost every single year since the 1500s, the cotton gin, the car, entire industries have turned upside down. Yeah, but this time it's different. They say, well, this time it's it's different, which is usually a bad phrase to start with. We don't really know the consequences of big shifts like this. Oh, Andrew Yang specifically talks about truck drivers. So if there's automated driving, which there will be, his argument is a good chunk of the land of being unemployed. But I think this is unclear. Automated driving really means right now automated highway driving. There's not automated driving in the cities. Nobody is actually working on automated driving for the cities. That's much more difficult technology. So yes, there will be less truck drivers on the highway, but because now you're gonna be able to run trucks 
all the time. We'll have many more goods being shipped around. When they get to the city, who's gonna drive the goods to the final destination? Well, they're gonna have to hire more drivers. Everybody's just looking at the worst case scenario, but a, a far more likely scenario is what has happened every time there's been uh, uh, an amazing technology that has changed lives. Yeah, UBI is a good thing, but don't you don't have to scare everybody to do it. Whether automation will cause less jobs or just a awkward transition to new jobs, the fact remains, unemployment does still exist now, anyway. And there's evidence that giving unconditional money to those that need it does do good things, which leads to number two on the list. Giving unconditional money to those that need it does good things, evidence suggests. Enter Joe Houston, CFO of Give Directly. Give Directly is a nonprofit. We give money to people who need it. Currently, we work across seven countries in Africa. We'll choose an area based off of data on where poor people live, hold a town hall meeting and sort of explain the program, explain that it's no strings attached. We'll then go door to door to sign people up, confirm that they live in the place we thought they did. Once a month, a couple people in that room over there press a button on a laptop. Instantly, people are getting text messages on those like old Nokia phones with snake <laughs> yeah. uh, saying they've received 400 bucks or 200 bucks or 20 bucks. What are the results? In the sort of last couple of decades, economists broadly have produced about 165 studies on just this idea of giving people money. I think some of the consistent themes are people are less poor, which is maybe obvious, but you see increases in assets, increases in earnings, increases in spending. Things like people feeling less stressed or happier or making more investments in health or education or things like that. There's an interesting study that gave cash to girls in Malawi. They got married later, pregnant later, and had lower rates of HIV because they had a little bit more security. And so, yeah, but are you... Building a league of lazy people who are never going to be working. Yeah. That mostly just doesn't bear out in the data. Oh, that's right. After the interview, they sent me this study from these economists from MIT and Harvard that analyzed seven different cash transfer experiments across the world showing that mostly just doesn't bear out in the data. Also, they told me what they just observed from their own experiments. Can you think of specific examples? Younger recipients no money to go to college and were stuck with their parents at home, have been able to start off small businesses out of their homes, moved to nearby marketplaces and are now one supporting themselves, living on their own, running their businesses, which is basically a demonstration of potential, uh, a need to grow. It's an, a catalytic effect for people to work even harder. Mm -hmm. So if it can lead to more work and more businesses opening up, that leads to the next thing on the list. There's evidence it's actually good for the economy. How does it affect the local economy? Like, do the prices go up? We just did a big study on this, actually, that was super yeah. interesting. We did find some price increases were about 0.1, 0.2% that I think don't make much of a difference for how well off people are. Big increases in overall spending and overall income in the economy. For every dollar transferred, there is $2.60 more in spending or income in the economy. If someone's just making $1,000 a month, they're going to spend 100% of it. So that's suddenly going from the government, which is an inefficient spender of money. Whereas humans are very efficient allocators of money. Like we'll hunt around for cheap prices, we'll buy food and support farmers and medicine, we'll buy homes, you know, and, and or rent apartments. So it's all yeah. gonna flow right back into your yeah. local economy. This is all well and good. But while I do believe that people given unconditional money will know what to do with it better than anyone else, and it will help their local economy, in the case of Give Directly, that's a bunch of money coming from generous donors. In the case of somewhere like the United States and something like everyone getting $1,000 a month, where does that money come from? Which leads to the trillions dollar question, how do we pay for it? I like the way Andrew Yang is proposing paying for it, which is, you know, have some combination between, it's called a VAT tax because you, uh, you tax the corporation, not the consumer. Something very, very similar to a sales tax. Not exactly a sales tax, so it's subtly different. I don't know if you wanna get into the nuances, but. Yeah, let's get detailed. VAT tax, value added tax. It's a consumption tax added onto a product at each stage of the supply chain, from production to point of sale. A mining company mines precious metals, they sell them to a computer chip company that, and they charge a tax. And the computer chip company makes computer chips and then they sell it to Apple and they charge a tax. Honestly, this is something I didn't know wasn't a thing. I looked it up and it actually is a thing in a lot of places but not in the United States. I know and some of you are commenting, this guy doesn't even know that a VAT tax wasn't a thing, blah, blah, blah. I've, I'm, I'm not an economist. I don't know. These, this is why I do these things, to learn. And I did learn. Anyway, the product has been taxed in many levels of the supply stream. So what happens when it goes to the consumer? 
consumer. Why did I say it like that? I don't know. And then the corporation then has an incentive to raise prices, but there's a lot of reasons to believe that wouldn't happen. Some percentage will be transferred to the consumer, but not 100%. Companies instead will focus on producing the goods more efficiently. Businesses are competing with each other, and the way you win that competition is often to lower prices. John Grisham could sell a lawyer novel for $10 million. No one's going to buy it. They'll go to Michael Connolly and, and I'll say, ah, enough John Grisham. This one's only $19.95. I'm going to buy this. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are also saying, well, this VAT tax will affect poor people who are just trying to buy groceries. No, you just don't put it on groceries. You don't put it on a lot of basic goods. You put it on more expensive goods. You put it on goods that aren't as necessary and maybe like, like a vice tax of sorts. He also wants to charge a little bit more for carbon credits. So that's a way of raising money from big corporations that produce fuel and energy uh, that there's always a demand for. So in what I would call James's optimistic view, things like corporations and certain products and vices would get taxed more, but not a lot of that would get passed on to the average consumer. Okay, we don't know that for sure, but okay. And another suggestion for where the money could come from, not controversial at all, which leads to another reason some people like universal basic income. Cut welfare programs. The thinking is that if everyone's getting a basic income, people won't need those benefits. It's not actually that simple though, and it seems like a lot of people would need more benefits than a basic income would provide. I, I think there's no question that if all you did was take the existing means-tested policies in the U.S., you know, policies focused on poor people, and then spread them equally across society. I, I think there is very little question that that would be bad for poor people. Andrew Yang attempted to address this. And the way Andrew Yang's proposing it, you often have a choice. I can do some sort of, you know, welfare or social security benefits, or I can take the UBI. There'll be some decrease in spending of social welfare programs to pay for the UBI, but people will be getting, they'll just choose the one that gives them greater benefit. But riddle me this. Let's say for argument's sake, you are dependent on $3,000 a month in total benefits. And so of course you opt to, to, to keep those rather than get the UBI. And of course that's assuming that UBI isn't phasing out those programs entirely, but you have it in an economy where everyone else is $12,000 a year richer. So almost by nature, the purchasing power of that is going to be decreased. The best way forward with regard to welfare versus direct cash is a question we will not be able to answer today. There's a very well-known experiment in Finland which tried to address this very question by giving money directly to unemployed people and replacing it with benefits to see what would happen. But in the end, the experiment was flawed because people still ended up getting benefits anyway. But that hasn't stopped a lot of people from declaring UBI a failure. Remember to read all the details. I wrote a song about that once. A headline's not in an article. A tweet is not in an article. But also check the article sources and be aware of any agenda the author might have. And by the way, the doobly-doo down here is gonna have a lot of links to a lot of different sources for this video and a lot of things I didn't even end up talking about. And if you're trying to follow up with something that's not down there, let me know. Maybe I just forgot to put it there. Or maybe I'm just lying to you. I'm not lying to you. Worst case scenario, I'm just wrong. But of course that could be a lie. Sorry, there's no way of knowing, except for diligently researching yourself. Okay, I think we addressed all of those original concerns I mentioned. Oh, except for communism. Okay. Definition of communism. Advocating class war and leading to a society in which all property is publicly owned and each person works and is paid according to their abilities and needs. That's just not what this is at all. It has nothing to do with private property and people are getting paid according to their citizenship. It has nothing to do with their ability or needs. Okay, maybe not communism, maybe you're saying socialism. Okay, let's look that up. A political and economic theory of social organization which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. Yeah, okay, no, UBI has nothing to do with the means of production. I guess you could argue that if everyone's getting a basic income, they will have a little bit more bargaining power with someone who owns the means of production, so maybe they just won't have to have crap hours and crap pay. But that is an optimistic view. There's also the idea that the VAT tax is a tax on the means of production, which you could say is a step in the direction of socialism, but that's an argument you can make about anything you don't like, because every new idea is a step in the direction of somewhere. Anyway, I don't think this is a step very far in the direction of one of those things. So given all the stuff we talked about, what do I think? I think there's promise that UBI could work depending on how it's funded and how it's implemented, but no one really knows what would happen if we suddenly gave everyone a thousand dollars a month in this country. And that's why I think all these experiments are good and we should do more of them. And in fact, we are doing a lot. This Wikipedia page shows a lot of the pilot programs that have happened and there's a lot more being talked about. In the state I live in, Wisconsin, the city of Milwaukee is going to try one, at least they're saying they are. Chicago has floated the idea. Newark, New Jersey. And again, a lot of them have already been done. Look around, read about them, but beware 
of dubious headlines. It seems like a lot of people take different reactions to the same experiment. Read the articles, look at the details. Most of the time, it's a mixed bag, which means I think we should keep doing them, and there's a good indication that we will keep doing them. This year, the Nobel Prize in Economics was just awarded to three people who basically pioneered the idea that we should test economic theories through experiments. It's weird that that took so long, you, you know. <laughs> and in the meantime, if you think giving people unconditional cash is a good thing, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And politically, it, you probably can't get it all. I think politically, a truly universal policy in the US, I think would be hard. My guess is that you can get a, a lot more bang for your I don't know, political buck by sort of doing something a little bit more incremental. Smaller things like converting food stamps into cash or housing subsidies into direct cash, or even making sure that welfare gets spent as cash to people instead of on marriage classes and all sorts of weird things that it actually ends up happening when it gets yeah. block granted to states. So that's pretty much all I got. Thank you for watching. Thanks to James for talking with me. I'm in an episode of his podcast. I talk all about my YouTube career linked down there. Thanks to Chelsea for talking with me. I'm going to be on their podcast. And thanks to Joe and Caroline for talking with me at Give Directly. And I'm going to link to their stuff down there too, because I really like what they're doing. Check them out. I do a week daily video blog talking about the stuff I'm working on over on Patreon for patrons if you want to support my basic income. Previous video is all about China and my meal planning adventure. Playlist of other Why Do People Like videos. Subscribe! Getting so close to a million subscribers. Now it's time for me to universal basically outgo. I'm a dork. Also, I already made that joke on Wheezy News. I'm such, I'm a super dork. Oh yeah.